Well, good evening, everyone, and happy Thursday here from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. I'm your host for the Tom Ruth Speaker Series, Zach Lehman, Headmaster here at the Hill. As you know, the Tom Ruth Speaker Series was created in honor of longtime beloved instructor of history emeritus, Tom Ruth, who taught at the Hill for 33 years and passed away in February 2016 when he endowed the Speaker Series. Our guest tonight is a, uh, a big fan of Tom Ruth. We're going to hear about that later. Ashley Schillingsburg Aldifer, class of 2002. Ashley is a public policy professional specializing in technology policy. She currently manages federal government relations for eBay. I think you've heard of eBay. Prior to joining eBay, Ashley spent nearly 10 years serving in senior positions in Congress as Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Congressman Dave Loebsack, Lob excuse me, Ashley drove the Congressman's legislative agenda and managed his work on the Influential Energy and Commerce Committee. Additionally, Ashley served as Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Congressman Bob Brady of Pennsylvania, overseeing his national security work as a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee. Prior to working in Congress, Ashley spent two years consulting for several telecommunications companies and trade associations. Ashley is a Hill alumna of the class of 2002 and was one of the 88 girls to enroll at Hill in its first year of co-education in 1998. She has a BA from Georgetown University, go Hoyas, and lives in Washington, DC with her husband and two young daughters who we are hoping will not make an appearance on the show tonight, um, but we'll see how that goes. Here's Ashley's uh, dial picture. I'm sure she didn't want me to show this, but we'll have to ask about some of her nicknames here, Mooney and Shildog, pretty cool. Uh, as you can see, she was involved in a lot of things during her time at the Hill. So we're going to let everyone see Ashley here and see me, I guess, eventually. If I can figure out how to do that. Hold on a second. I'm going to start my video, and then I'm going to start Ashley's video. Hold on, Ashley. There you go. You should be able to show your video. Ashley, are you there? Yes, hi. I'm sorry that I embarrassed you with your dial picture. That's okay. It's you great look, to see it. You look pretty much the same. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Looks like you could still, you know, the, the six form blazer might be in your closet somewhere. You might wear that on a special occasion. I actually, I just packed it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, glad you're uh, with us tonight. Um, I, I see you're there on the beautiful mall in uh, DC. You're outside for the evening, participating with yes. your virtual background. Well, uh, I'm enjoying the cherry blossoms that no one could this year, unfortunately. Yeah, well, thanks for being here. Um, so, so, Ashley, first question, when you came to Hill, you're among the first group of girls. Uh, where, where were you living at the time? So I'm originally from Collegeville, Pennsylvania, which is about 20 minutes from Hill. Sure. Um, had always heard of the Hill School and, you know, ran track there when I was um, at the local public middle school um, was never really on my radar until I found out that they were going to be accepting girls in 1998, which would have been my third form year. So how did you find out about that? Was there, I, I've heard there was like an ad in the Pottstown Mercury or something. <laughs> Do you remember? Honestly, I can't even remember. There were uh, a number of girls actually in my neighborhood that ended up um, all applying and, and attending Hill. Um, so we, we had a little cohort uh, commuting together every day on 422. Uh, we, I was a day student for, for my first three years at Hill. Uh, I can't remember how word spread about it. Do you remember your interview? I vaguely, yeah. So it was with Mrs. Doherty. Um, I remember I was wearing a purple plaid skirt. <laughs> I just remember being like falling in love with the campus immediately. So what was it like, um, you know, those first couple of years? I mean, I've talked to, obviously talked to alumni who uh, were here at that time. You know, you were, you were certainly uh, one of the few. Um, what was that like? What, what, was, uh, what were some of the key moments in being one of our first girls on campus? Uh, it was nerve wracking at first. Uh, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, our first day of class, there were news cameras from the local news station covering the fact that Hill was going co-ed for the first time in nearly 150 years. Um, and, but quickly the novelty wore off and things kind of got to normal. 
Um, the third form class was a little bit more balanced than some of the upper classes. I think we were like 40, 60, and then almost even by the time I, I graduated. Um, but the, the sixth form class, what, what is it, like 16 girls that were in that class? So it was a little bit of a different experience in, in the upper classes, but it was, it was exciting. Um, it was amazing to see like the doctor's office didn't really know how to deal with girls for, <laughs> for a little while, but things got, you know, normal pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and those, uh, those older girls, the sixth form girls and PGs, did you strike up like a relationship with them? Were they role models for you that first year? I know they were pretty strong uh, leaders in the school. Yeah, there were a couple, particularly in the beginning, I did uh, preseason field hockey and some of the older girls definitely helped um, kind of set the tone, uh, which was really helpful. I mean, starting as a freshman in high school, I think is nerve wracking for everybody, but particularly given the situation, it was great to have some people who had already been high school students. Yeah. And was that, uh, was that Coach Watson, Meg Watson? Was she the coach at the time? Who was the field hockey coach? Do you remember? Uh, uh, Spraccio. Yeah, of course. And then my, my recollection was that on Lawrenceville weekend, the girls actually tied uh, in that game or maybe lost one nothing, but it was a really big moment for girls uh, the first my first meeting. third form year, I was actually on um, the junior team, and we actually won our game. Wow. So we were very proud of that. <laughs> but yes, you're right. I think they, they did tie. Well, I don't know if you followed things this fall, but our girls field hockey team was the last game of the big Lawrenceville weekend for the for annual, the first annual uh, Meg's Green Cup. And it all came down to their game and they won they won the Maple Trophy, they won the Hill Lawrenceville Trophy, and then they won the Meg's Green Cup, all, all with one win, the last game of the night. So no pressure there. Wow. <laughs> so you mentioned to me before we started uh, the, the webcast this evening that you had a, a pretty special connection to, to Tom Ruth. Can you share that with our audience a little bit? Sure, yeah. I, I had Mr. Ruth for my uh, European history class my fourth form year. I love history. I, it was one of my majors in college. I particularly love European history. So given the, the content, um, I was pretty enamored with the class and he was such a special um, instructor. He was such an a special teacher, uh, really engaged the class, but taught history through a present day lens and always um, tried to you know, help students understand the history that they were living every day, uh, the importance of civics. It was really the first exposure that I ever had to any kind of political or, or civics or, or government uh, coursework. Um, and he actually, he cared so much about people being informed about current events that he bought the entire school subscriptions to Newsweek. Hmm. Um, and they would just litter the campus, but it was how I kind of became a news junkie. I thought that I was gonna be a journalist before I, I got into politics and he would um, help critique some of my writing and, and really helped me think about what I wanted to do and um, the kind of policy that I might wanna get into at some point. And yeah, so I, I really, I credit him with, um, you know, at least getting me on my chosen career path. And I know that he would love the fact that these conversations are happening right now because this is exactly what he loves to talk about, you know, li living history and, and being involved and, yeah. and thinking about things through, through a greater historical context. If we could only add a conspiracy theory to it, then he'd really be happy. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I obviously knew Tom when I first started uh, here at Hill. Um, Tom had retired by that point. Um, he came up to me during the first reunion. I, I, had just, I was just about to start and I was meeting some of the alumni and he, he came up to me and, and politely introduced himself and asked me if I would consider, uh, al would allow him to include me in his weekly newsletter, um, which I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I of course said yes uh, to the legendary Tom Ruth and it proceeded to crash my email for the next several years. Uh, every weekend I'd get that email and it would crash, but uh, I assume you were, I, I assume you stayed in touch with him and he probably followed your career closely. Well, I, yeah, I, 
I fell off of his email list at some point when I was in college and, you know, unfortunately drifted away a little bit. Um, so, but again, he, I, I really credit him with, with where I am now. And, and I think this is such a great honor to his legacy. Well, you may have drifted away uh, contact from him, but I'm quite certain he followed you, you closely. He, he tended to keep track of his, uh, his students, especially those that went into fields like yours. So, um, so, so you, you did pretty well at Hill. Uh, it was a good experience overall. Um, oh yeah, and, I loved Hill. Yeah, and then went on to Georgetown. So, um, what what drew you? Was that you know was that you know, like the first step in your political career? You knew you wanted to be close to Washington, or was that uh, the byproduct of going to Georgetown? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, they kind of fed each other. I did a uh, week in DC. Um, forget what the name of the program was, but it was a journalism focused program where you got to go and um, meet with your member of Congress and do all the cool DC stuff. And we stayed at Georgetown. So fell in love with the school, knew, knew pretty early that that was where I wanted to focus, applied early action. And uh, yeah, the rest was history. <laughs> and and uh, I know you uh, obviously graduated from Georgetown. What did you study there? Uh, government and history and English. And so at the time, did Georgetown have a, a very close relationship with the Hill and internships and externships and that sort of thing? Were you constantly you know, internships and that sort of thing? You would think, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it was really up to students to, to take the initiative and, and do things. Uh, but obviously proximity, so many students did. Yeah. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to intern on the Hill um, the other hill, con the Congress hill. <laughs> and <laughs> I got to work with some cool nonprofits. And um, I actually was so lucky. I got an internship my senior year that paid and I got to work full time and take like one class while I was at Georgetown. And that became my first job. Uh, so which be was that being, job? sorry, which, which congressman? Or congressperson? It was actually for, it was for a small uh, government relations consulting firm. Okay. And so you did that for a couple of years and then found your way uh, back to the Hill, like literally. How did you get that first job in, in, the, in Congress? I just kind of cold applied and um, it was for Congressman Bob Brady uh, from, uh, he was the first district of Pennsylvania, represented about half of Philadelphia. And uh, fortunately, I got it and uh, quickly became his legislative director and was running his entire policy operation. I loved working for him. He's still active in politics. He's the um, head of the Democratic Party in Philadelphia, but uh, he retired from Congress a couple of years ago. Uh, really uh, old school, politico kind of guy. And I got to do all of his national security work on the Armed Services Committee, which is a great experience. Um, so we have um, tonight, our AP government class is, is uh, listening in, or many of them are listening in. I'm not sure if you took that class here at Hill or not, or if it was offered. Um, but obviously some of them are interested in a career in, in politics. So what's that first job like uh, in a con in co congressional office? You know, uh, how many other uh, staffers are there? How do you sort of figure out what role you're going to play? How do you build responsibility? How does that work? Great question. First, if, if anyone's interested, I hope they'll get in touch. Um, I, I love connecting people. Um, there was a Hill alum that I helped uh, with a job for another Pennsylvania member recently. Uh, it's a great place to work. It's a great career. And if, if anyone's interested, I'm, I'm always happy to help. Um, the, the first jobs on the Hill, uh, well, it, it very much depends on the office, uh, on the member of Congress. Each office is so dictated by the personality and political agenda of the member. But um, I'll say that working, it, the, the jobs that seem the coolest, working, you know, for the speaker or, you know, for the minority leader or something, um, you may get less exposure because there are a lot of people in those offices and you might be the person, you know, making coffee or, or, or filing things or, or whatever. 
Um, but when you're working for a small house office that really needs you to actually do the work because they don't have a lot of resources, even as an intern, you're probably going to be doing, you know, some substantive work. A lot of answering the phones, some giving congressional tours, but you'll probably help get to process mail. Um, constituents write in every single day complaining about everything. <laughs> <laughs> How many congressional tours did you give in your in your time? I never had to give any. <laughs> oh wow! That, I don't know how I handled that, but I never had to give any. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you didn't even have to train others to give them. No. No, <laughs> I was I was lucky because I, I I never wanted to to give tours, but I did have to answer the phones a lot. No, no. So, so in that first job, was there a moment? Uh, when you were just hooked, like something happened, you were given some assignment or your congressman listened to you for the first time or, you know, took your research up to the hill to a hearing or something like that. What, what was that moment for you where you knew you were in the right place? It was immediate. Um, I mean, really, it was, it was as soon as I came to D.C. that I knew that I wanted to be in policy. Um, you know, the the Hamilton musical, the song, The Room Where It Happens. I mean, that's that's what working in politics and policy is, is you're you're always contributing to something, um, thinking about you know the big issues of the day, trying to work for the greater good, whether you agree with the people that you're working with or not. It's it's a pretty exciting environment to be in. And and I noticed you worked for a Democrat and a Republican in your time, right on the Hill. One no, the actually, they're they're both uh, they're both Democrats. There was another Brady who was a Republican, but okay. my bosses were both Democrats. Um, well, obviously, during your time, you had people in your office that were probably Democrats working for uh, Republicans working for Democrats, Democrats working for Republicans. Um, how, how does that work? You know, what if you don't agree with the policy, but it's a great job and. Uh, or you don't agree with the politics, and it's a great job. I mean, there are there are people who switch parties. Uh, there are people who you know work for a Democrat and then um, decide. Well, at least people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Go work for Republicans. Uh, there are members. There's and there are senators who <laughs> have sure. switched parties. Um, you Pres usually presidents that have switched parties. <laughs> presidents and right. former presidential. Uh, Candidates, yes, it, it, it does happen. Um, and you know, the, the spectrum of our political system has, has changed so much over the last couple of years, especially um, people who thought that they were moderate Democrats might wake up one day and say, oh, this isn't actually really the party that I thought it was and, and, and kind of realign. But it, mo mostly you, you start in a career and that's, that's kind of, those are your people. You're, you're labeled pretty early on and um, you work in those circles and you, you work within one party. So you, you went from one congressional office to another. Um, wh why did you make that change? Um, and, and what was the big difference between those two positions? Well, it was the same position, um, but working for a Philadelphia office and then going and working for Southeastern Iowa very, very different. I'd never stepped foot in the state of Iowa before, but the congressman needed someone who had experience with telecommunications policy and national security policy, um, and I had both. So it, it kind of was a match made in heaven from, from that standpoint, but I had to work really hard to quickly understand what it was to be an Iowan. Um, I, in, I have to admit, I was kind of one of those people that was like, oh, Ohio, oh, Idaho, Iowa, what's really the difference? Yeah. Uh, which is uh, terribly elitist and, and coastal of me to say, but it, it was true at the time. I've since grown a great appreciation for the state of Iowa and the people there. Um, it's a really fascinating place to work politically because of their first in the, na in the nation status yeah. um, and, and the caucus system. We saw that break down a little bit this year, we did, yeah. um, but uh, it's it's a really cool place. So, um, and is that it, it was how, a, how unusual is that, Ashley, for a non-state resident to work for a state congressman or senator? Is that pretty common or unusual? It's probably about fifty-fifty. It's it's great when you're able to work for someone. Um, 
who represent, represents an area that you know, either you went to school there or you uh, grew up there because um, the people that you're going to be meeting with, I mean, come in and talk about places and institutions and businesses and schools and parks that, that you know about. Mm -hmm. And it's also, um, you know, the easiest way to get in touch politically with how people think. Uh, again, I, I really had to train myself to think Iowan. I think I did a pretty good job. <laughs> how was, how often did you actually go out to Iowa in that time, in that time period? Well, I had just had uh, my first daughter, so I didn't go out as much as I should have, but I, I went out a couple times and, and, uh, was really surprised by, um, how different Iowa was from, from my preconceived notion of it. Yeah. Um, we, you know, he represented a lot of urban areas, um, and obviously a lot of cornfields, <laughs> but um, a lot of areas that were not dissimilar from Pottstown, frankly. So it was familiar in some ways and, and new in others. And so how many, right. years in that, how many years in that office? About three years in that office. And from there, you made the jump to eBay or? It, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so, so what drew you away from working uh, in public service and, and to working, you know, on the, on the private sector side, um, still obviously in, with policy and, and uh, government relations in mind, but um, was it a purely financial decision? Was it a philosophical decision? Was it a, a you know, a leadership and responsibility? What, what drew you? Uh, there were a couple of factors. It, it, uh, hill life can be very draining. Capital Hill life can be very well, draining. Hill life too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I had just had my second daughter and kind of was looking towards the exits thinking it, it might be time. And fortunately, um, the, the eBay job kind of fell in my lap. Um, I had actually sold on eBay while I was working in Congress mm -hmm. because um, public servants sometimes need a way to help make ends meet. <laughs> so uh, going to junk shops and uh, antique stores and stuff and finding cool things and selling them on eBay was one of the ways that I actually bought my house. Yeah. Um, a lot of it. So I was, I was kind of a fangirl, um, loved technology policy and wanted to work for a company that was, um, you know, that had a philosophy that I could believe in. There are a lot of lobbying jobs out there. Um, some of them are great, some of them not so great. And working for a company that's really um, purpose-driven, that is about uh, enabling people and giving them economic opportunity was really exciting for me. That's great. Did you, um, uh, you obviously were interested in technology. Was there something about eBay other than, you know, your experience apparently funding your house purchase? Uh, was there something sp specific about eBay that made it appealing to you? You know, there's, there's obviously a lot of technology companies that are looking for a voice in Washington. And um, what was it about eBay that drew you in particular? Um, again, it's, it's the fact that eBay is built off of entrepreneurs and small businesses. And there are other, and for, for those who don't know, I mean, there are, you know, people on here that are younger than eBay. <laughs> eBay was, uh, we're actually in our 25th year. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this fall. Um, so people may or may not really understand what eBay is. Um, eBay is a third party marketplace. You know, you can, as, as a average Joe go on eBay and sell an old computer game or something, but we actually have millions of small businesses that, um, you know, run, run a real, a real business and reach a global market by just having a storefront on our platform. And so, um, that, that was really exciting to me to be able to support those companies and support those people and their livelihoods um, and also get to work with them because working with the small businesses that use our platform is half of the job and then 
you know, talking to policymakers is the other half. So it's 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 a great place to to land after um, being in public service. Well, I want to take a deeper dive on eBay and and sort of in the pre-COVID-19 era and then in the COVID-19 area. But uh, before I do that, um, was there ever a time uh, that you thought about running for office yourself? Not really, no. Uh, I I watched too many people go through it and <laughs> just say, maybe there was, but it has been so beaten out of me. <laughs> No, I don't think I would. We're in the room where it happened too often. Exactly. It's it's a hard, hard job running for Congress. Um, and I was I was never, aside from spending my spare time supporting my my boss's campaigns, I was never much of a campaign person. Mm. I just I don't know. I don't have the the fortitude for it. Uh, you know, the lack of sleep, sleeping on people's couches, eating pizza all the time. Just and you're pretty much putting your entire life and soul into something from, to lose <laughs> and you're pretty much running from the day you take office right i mean it's it's just a non-stop cycle absolutely um so it's it's not something that ever uh really appealed to me but um there's still time yeah we'll see <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh let's get back to ebay for a minute and um i do want to encourage our listeners to start adding their questions. We'll turn to our listeners' questions in, in just a few minutes. And there's two ways to do that. You can add your question in the Q&A box or you can raise your hand. And tonight we're going to try something new. We're actually going to um, try showing video of people that raise their hands. I'm not sure if that's going to uh, encourage more people or less people to uh, raise their hands, but we'll, we'll find out. So if you want to ask a question to Ashley, uh, you can start posting it now or raise your hand and we'll get to you in just a few minutes. Um, so so you were at eBay, you said you've been there now two years. So pretty much two years before the era of COVID-19. So what, what kinds of things are you doing for eBay in that time period? What are the biggest issues facing up until about three months ago or two or three months ago? What were the biggest issues facing technology companies from a government relations standpoint? And, and what were you advocating for? And what kinds of policies were you working with, for and against? Sure. Well, when I came to eBay was uh, pretty much the exact moment when the perception of technology companies in Washington changed dramatically. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term tech lash, but particularly the, the large platforms, um, Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, have come under very intense scrutiny for any trust reasons, uh, for data privacy and data security reasons. And so uh, a lot of those issues have dictated a lot of the work that we do uh, at eBay, um, talking about how we use user data, um, trying to influence federal legislation regarding user data, um, there's a lot of focus right now on third party marketplaces and the level of responsibility and liability that they should have for purchases made on the platform. Mm -hmm. So uh, we spend a lot of time on that issue, which is uh, taken up a lot of my time. And we also do a lot of work around um, global trade. Almost all of the small businesses on our platform sell to international customers. Uh, so making sure that cross-border trade is seamless for small businesses who, you know, didn't used to have the opportunity to really be uh, fully integrated into a global supply chain, but can now access the entire world um, just by, you know, going on a platform like eBay. Um, so is it safe make, to say, making, sorry, excuse me, I didn't mean to just no, go ahead. interrupt. Uh, is it safe to say that for those first two years you were um, sort of on defense, uh, mostly? A lot of defense, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and um, how, how, do you, how do you play defense? So are you up on the hill talking to congressmen and senators and, and other policymakers? Or are you, uh, you know, are they coming to you? And, you know, sort of give us what a typical day looks like in a role like yours if there is such a thing. 
usually when a member of Congress comes to you, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, <laughs> But uh, yes, I, I spend the vast majority of my time up on the hill um, explaining who, who we are, what our platform is, um, how we're helping people, um, what we're doing right, what we can be doing better, how policy can help us do what we're doing. And um, yeah, I'm constantly in cabs <laughs> going yeah. to and from the hill. And, and uh, you know, our congressional system is you know, a state representative system, but a company like eBay has sort of no borders, right? Your, your small businesses are trading domestically and internationally. So how are you choose? are you mostly going to committee members, you know, for their roles and their influence in committees, or are you, are you doing a state by state approach too? Uh, well, we, we actually also have a state team um, who, who flies around the, I mean, under normal circumstances, flies around the entire country dealing with state legislatures. Um, that's a hard job. Yeah. It's a very hard job. State, state government relations is a really interesting and, and, uh, very, um, very niche, uh, world that I, I, I honestly, I, I don't have a lot of experience with, but y yes, I mean, with uh, 535 members and you know just one of me, you do have to prioritize who who you're talking to and who you're meeting with. Yeah. Um, we also we we bring in our solar community to meet with their members of Congress. We have a fly-in every year um, where we try to bring in 20 to 30 small business sellers to come and talk about their issues, and we utilize grassroots and grass tops. Um, so we have a really engaged community that we uh, inform and work to keep them in touch with our members. It's, eBay was actually kind of one of the first companies to really start using corporate grassroots. Yeah. And it's been very, very successful and very powerful. So I saw you last in person, I want to say maybe five weeks ago, seems like five years ago, at, at the yeah. Washington DC alumni event. Um, and I think we were chatting about uh, tech companies paying federal taxes. I think that was your biggest issue we were talking about at that moment. And literally two or three days later, the whole world changes, right? Um, but it yeah. changes, I'm sure it didn't just change for us personally and institutions. How did it change for you in your role? And not just that you were working from home, but what were the new issues that you were now facing um, in, in your role um, as you represented eBay? Well, it's all COVID all the time. Um, you know, I'm really, really fortunate to, to have a job right now and to be working for a company that um, is enabling people to uh, get through this. You know, we're, we're seeing people who operate brick and mortar stores going, um, on eBay and trying to get rid of inventory that they aren't able to sell in their in their uh, regular store right now. Um, we're seeing consumers flocking to eBay to, you know, buy all the things that they need to stay happy and healthy and productive. Or, uh, we just released some information. Puzzle sales are up 1300% year over year. What, what, uh, I think I have half of them in my house. Puzzles. Oh, puzzles. Yeah. Oh. Wow, that's a big. Um, yeah, uh, lots of home office equipment and um, workout equipment. So we've, you know, really fortunate to be working for a company that's that's you know doing well through through this crisis. Um, but more importantly, to be working for a company that is helping others do well through this crisis. And um, but unfortunately, you know, you also are going to have people trying to take advantage of a third party marketplace. And yeah. you've seen a lot of people trying to price gouge personal protective equipment, stuff like hand sanitizers and yeah, those, those toilet bro paper. Those brothers in like, what was it in Tennessee or in Kentucky or something that were hoarding hand sanitizer in their garage they yeah. were on eBay? They tried. We we had to actually stop all hand sanitizer and face mask sales on the on the site because it was uh, it was so out of control. So you know we've been working with regulatory agencies and and state and uh, federal governments trying to. Uh, I mean there are a lot of price gouging laws that are out there. 
Yeah. So we've been trying to help our sellers comply with with statutes and um, you know trying to make sure that e-commerce is considered an essential service, which it really is right now. Trying to make sure that postal service uh, survives this crisis is really important. Right. Um, so everything. Sorry. That's big in the news in the last few days in terms of will the post office survive uh, COVID-19 and how that will impact rural areas. Back to your Iowa days, you know, how will rural areas deal that don't have, you know, Amazon delivery or, you know, FedEx and UPS and DHL and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Most people don't realize that the, the private carriers charge at least a $6 surcharge to deliver to rural areas. And sometimes their definition of rural is, is really kind of awesome. exurban. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one thing um, I mentioned to you earlier, um, some of our listeners may recall, Mike Vaughn was on, was on the um, webcast uh, last week and um, his experience with Venmo. And he said it was really interesting that just by following the, the social media component of Venmo, you could really tell a lot about what society was going through, like using what avatars they were using and uh, what emojis they were using. And that's, I'm sorry, avatars is the wrong word, emojis they were using. And you mentioned, you know, like home gym sales are going up and puzzles are going up. So what, what are you, what is, what is eBay learning about our social interactions right now um, that, you know, that you can share with the audience? I mean, what, just in terms of what things are being purchased and sold? I mean, you've, you've mentioned a few of them, but are, is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, we've seen a lot of, um, like, a lot of do-it-yourself, a lot of garden, a lot of um, books and home improvement. hair dye. And it's just, it's I don't have that problem. I, it was not me. <laughs> I was not buying the hair dye. <laughs> and clippers, too. Um, <laughs> I wish. It's, it's I wish I knew. Been fascinating. <laughs> it's been fascinating to, to be able to watch so quickly um, all of this inventory change. And, uh, you know, people come to eBay. You know, eBay used to be where people sold like Beanie Babies and thought they were going to be billionaires. Probably uh, any of the Hill students on the phone uh, don't even know what Beanie Babies are. But um there's it's a platform now where people buy a lot of like actual new stuff that you would go to you know target or, or amazon for or anything um but yeah seeing everything going from you know a lot of apparel and sneakers and um dresses to like just getting through and hunkering down with your family and trying to teach your kids and board games and it's it's really been very interesting and it's it's uh, really great that the company is trying to help uh, get this information to small businesses so that they understand how valuable their inventory is right now. And so, you know, a lot of us who've used eBay over the years are familiar with it as a more of an auction site um, and a used goods or antiques or hard to find items. But what you're saying now is that it's moved very much to a, a new product uh, market and I'm sure they're not using auction, they're just using the buy it now feature and set prices, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's about 80% new and about 80% buy it now. I mean, we still have lots of auctions, sure. still have the cool one of a kind antique, right. whatever that you're looking for, but a lot, a lot of everyday goods too. But that, but that, has that been a significant change just in the last month or two, or has it, has it always been closer to, or in recent years, been closer to 80% and 80% new and, and buy it now? Uh, that's been over the past couple of years that we've, uh, that we've been more, more new, more, more of what you would think of as like traditional retail, yeah. although we're not a retailer. And then, and then from a policy standpoint, you mentioned you're dealing with some regulative, regulative issues and, um, price gouging. What are some of the other policy issues that are coming up right now as it relates to COVID-19? I mean, you talked about postal service. Are there issues around, you know, we're all now careful with our mail and we're, you know, leaving packages outside for a day or two to, you know, decontaminate. I, I mean, are there, are there um, 
other policies that are impacting your ability uh, to function um, and to support local businesses or small businesses? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of disruption in global trade, um, which again is a big part of our platform. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, if you buy something from another country, it probably actually uh, fl comes over via a commercial uh, plane. A lot of commercial planes have a lot of cargo capacity and with uh, no commercial flights, uh, all that cargo capacity has, has gone away. So that's been pretty disrupted to, I mean, everyone's supply chains um, and you know, carriers and, and post operators around the world are, are working uh, quickly to try to remedy that. Um, but, you know, one of the other things that we're spending a lot of time on is making sure that there are supports for small businesses in um, coronavirus stimulus legislation. Uh, we just saw the third bill pass a couple of weeks ago that had some great loan programs for small businesses. Um, one of the programs actually ran out of money today. Yeah, the paycheck, so, paycheck protection plan, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. And uh, we talked to some of our sellers who, you know, applied from the very beginning, but because they didn't have a previous relationship with a financial institution, frankly, a lot of our sellers don't have to raise capital to start selling on eBay. They grow organically. So um, they don't have lending relationships. They've never worked with the SBA before. So they're really at a disadvantage when these programs are set up yeah. to get money out the door quickly, which is great. But where uh, if you don't have a previous lending relationship, uh, it's hard to get your foot in the door. So we're, we're working on that a lot right now. So how many employees does eBay have? Do you know a rough number? I think it's, yes, I do, but I'm, I'm blanking. <laughs> it's gotta be in the tens of thousands, right? No, is it four thousand? I think it's four thousand. Okay, and they're not. They're not a lot in DC. <laughs> and their headquarters are on the West Coast. Yeah, we're in San Jose, yeah. so we actually shut down very quickly. Yeah. Um. And so you're, uh, how how is that working in terms of your employees being now all working from home, different time zones? I mean, they were always working in different time zones for you and for for that matter, but. Um, do you think that the company is becoming more efficient or is it really challenging uh, to you know, work with your colleagues? You know, it's it's been really interesting working in D.C. and working for a tech company and kind of straddling these two different worlds. Um, eBay was already such a video conference call um, culture. Uh, it was actually a big culture shock for me when I left the Hill because everything was in person on, on the Hill in, in Congress. And um, so eBay and I think a lot of the other tech companies, not only are their tools very in demand right now, but they've been utilizing these tools for a long time and it was very easy to, to adapt. Yeah. Uh, Congress, on the other hand, is really struggling right now. Um, I've had my first Zoom calls with congressional staff. They don't really seem to get it. I wouldn't have either if I were still on the Hill. Yeah. It's it's kind of anathema to, to Hill staff to do conference calls. Uh, you're used to everyone coming to you all of the time. Congress is trying to figure out how to um, handle proxy voting or remote voting. Um, you know, we've been in this crisis for what, six weeks now, but... Um, and what you call the beginning of the crisis, but yeah. Yeah, I, we, we, we've had some time to, to deal with this and, and the house is, is just starting to figure out, uh, they've just put out today um, some of the procedures that they're considering for proxy voting. So it's, it's been really fascinating to see how these two entirely different institutions have, have adapted during this crisis. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that you're in a cab most days uh, before this <laughs> happened. So now you're you're in Zooms instead of in cabs, right? And you're and and even getting access, you can't just like knock on a door anymore. Or, you know, go up to the hill. You have to find a way to get to someone's email address or to the to, you know get on their calendar, right? It's a, a little bit different. Yeah, it it makes pre-existing relationships all the all that much more important um, when you can't go in and just you know introduce yourself to somebody. Um, it's a lot easier to call somebody on the phone when you, when you know them already. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's changed things a lot, but um, 
I think people are starting to adapt. Well, you ready for some of our audience questions? Yes, please. Okay, well, apparently everyone on the call has the same last name as you. They're all your relatives asking, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they might be, they might be. But uh, uh, anyway, just a reminder to our audience, and we have a lot of students here, the, the numbers have grown since we started. We The word must be out, Ashley, that we're, we have a good <laughs> show going here tonight. Um, I've got a handful of written questions, but remember, if you raise your hand, uh, you get to ask your question live to Ashley, and and uh, we're even willing to put you on screen if you're wearing, you know, appropriate clothing. Uh, so the first comes from Paula Schaefer, uh, who apparently knows you because she says, "Ashley, woohoo!" She didn't say it that way, but that's all she said. It wasn't even a question. Uh, okay, thank here's you, your Paula. <laughs> hey, Paula. All right, so here's your first question from Susan. Uh, what are your thoughts on tech giants using consumer data to track people who have come into contact with COVID-19 and the potential implications it has on our civil liberties? And actually, it's not from Susan. It's from Jake Myers' class of 2015, uh, who's probably calling us from Boston or tuning in from Boston. Hey, Jake, how you doing? So COVID-19 and, and tracing, um, uh, you know, Apple and Google have been talking about doing that recently. Um, is eBay playing a role in that? How do you, what do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? So we're not playing a, a role in, in contact tracing um, yet, or that I know of, or I hope we are not. Right. It's going to make my life very difficult. Um, but I think, again, data privacy has been a huge topic of conversation in tech for a number of years. And you have consumers who are concerned with um, unauthorized sharing of the color shoes that they're buying. I have a really hard time believing that a uh, majority of users are gonna be comfortable with this level of data sharing, although I understand that there is a lot of anonymity to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anonymity, thank that's you. It's a, a tough one, I guess. <laughs> but um, it's, going, it's going to be a challenge. I'm, you, even from a um, you know platform perspective, from a from a commercial perspective, you know you you always are looking at how consumers view their privacy relative to some kind of cost benefit analysis. You know what are people willing to give up, in, in order to receive better and more relevant um, search results, for instance. Um, so it, it's entirely possible that the vast majority of people out there are, are willing to give up some privacy in order to um, have, you know, well-informed alerts if they've come into contact with something, with someone with COVID. Um, it's, it's just really hard to picture that given how um, intensely Americans care about uh, data privacy right now. Yeah, it's like a balance, though, between privacy and freedom, right? Uh are we willing to give up some level of our privacy so that we can have more freedoms to leave our homes? Um, yeah. Be healthy and, and safe. Um, well, it, it uh, certainly will be interesting. Um, thanks for the question, Jake. Uh, next question comes from one of our current students, Alexander, who says, who asks, why is state and federal government relations so different? Or why are state and federal government relations so different? You mentioned before that it's sort of a niche uh, state uh, state relations are a little bit different. Can you can you uh, expand on that a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so state legislatures and 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 governors, um, as as much as each member of Congress is its own body, um, it, even more so at the state level. I mean, the legislatures, some of them are full time jobs, some of them are half time jobs. Um, they're only there for for a portion of the year. Um, they can move very very quickly. Um, you know, they'll kind of get a piece of legislation and cook it up and pass it in a week. Mm -hmm. Things move glacially slowly in Congress, as, as I think everyone is probably pretty well aware. Um, and so you have to really understand uh, all of the dynamics of each legislative body, the local politics involved. Um, there's just, there's so many people to know and so many dynamics to understand. It's it's really, I, I've really loved kind of tangentially being involved in it because I, I find it fascinating. I'm glad I don't have to do it for a living. 
because I would be spending my time in planes rather than in cabs. Yeah. But um, it, it is a really interesting world. Well, as, a, as a Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics is local, right? Exactly. Well, thank you uh, for that. Um, one of your old teachers, perhaps, Mr. Dolhoff. Uh, I don't know if you had Mr. Dolhoff for math, but he says, I'm wondering what Ashley thinks about potential changes in the global supply chain, she referenced. With the pandemic, the limitations of such a supply chain have been laid bare. How does she think things may be different after COVID-19? It's, it's such a good question. Um, I think one of the biggest threats we're gonna face in the short term in terms of global trade is um, increased pressures towards isolationism and countries wanting to protect their borders and to protect their domestic in industries and to restrict imports and exports. So I think that the challenges that we're going to be seeing are going to be less logistical and more, um, again, I isolationist. And that's really unfortunate. We were already seeing a lot of these trends develop prior to the COVID crisis. Um, the World Trade Organization has, um, is kind of falling apart right now. Um, there was a debacle that a lot of my time on over a little known international institution known as the Universal Postal Union, which deals with uh, postal rights throughout the world that the US almost destroyed. Uh, fortunately, we didn't. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the first test is going to be seeing how uh, countries can work together uh, versus just retreating into themselves. And hi, Mr. Dahlhoff. Um, you talked about the postal service earlier. Um, can you can you share a little bit more about that? So, if, if the postal service collapses, as some are predicting right now, um, as a result of COVID nineteen, what um, what would that be like for eBay or or some of the other major tech companies that are using the, the postal service for delivery? I mean, what what would you see happening? That's that's part of the supply chain, but it's also part of the delivery chain, which yeah, uh, I think a lot of people don't appreciate how integral uh, the Postal Service is into a lot of the deliveries that they get, uh, whether it's first mile, meaning when someone drops something off at the post office or, um, you know, send something or last mile, um, you know, something is delivered to you. Um, even companies that operate their own logistics and delivery services uh, often rely on the Postal Service at some point in their, in their supply chain. So uh, it would be pretty devastating for uh, the entire e-commerce industry. And obviously, as e-commerce has increasingly been how uh, consumers and businesses alike are, are surviving through this crisis, it would be pretty, pretty devastating if, if the Postal Service weren't able to function right now. So if you were advising a young entrepreneurial um, policy, you know, a budding policymaker, how could someone go about trying to make change and, and preserve the postal service? Is it write your congressman well, they, right now? Yeah, write your congressman, and, for and how sure. Do you get, how do you get that mail to your congressman? <laughs> right? Send an email. <laughs> or you can send it to the mail. Uh, you know, they, USPS could use the stamp. Um, yeah, people, uh, there's been actually a great, I mean, for people who are steeped in, in postal policy all the time um, and understand that nobody cares about it because it's really boring and really wonky and weird, um, to see things like Save the USPS trending on Twitter has been truly astonishing. Uh, there's definitely a lot of attention being paid. There have been some great ed editorials written recently, which has uh, helped get a little bit of momentum going behind this. but. Really, in the short term, they need emergency appropriations. They're asking for $25 billion in cash from Congress. Congress just spent $2 trillion. Um, you know, Congress can come together in a crisis and uh, act quickly, but it, unfortunately, that time may have passed for, some, for something that big to happen really quickly. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. That's, that's what we're working on. Where, where in your ranking of policy issues for eBay would you put postal policy? Is that 
top five, top 10 right now, or is it, yeah? Top five, pretty, pretty historically, it's, it's in the top five actually. And so, but there's probably people on the other side of that who would like to see the postal service go away, right? The FedExes and UPSs and Amazons of the world, maybe, maybe not, because they, they do use those as part of their services, right? They do. Um, I don't think anyone wants to see the Postal Service go away. Um, there are certainly some interests amongst the private carriers to um, price things a little bit differently and to potentially have USPS not offering competitive services. Um, but a Amazon does utilize the Postal Service quite a bit and, and we work pretty closely with them on a lot of these issues. Well, one of my favorite apocalyptic movies is The Postman. Uh, with Kevin Costner. I don't know if you've seen that movie. That's I haven't. Definitely dating. No, I have to. You, know, you definitely have to see it if you're a postal wonk, which apparently you are. <laughs> All right. I just want to encourage people. We haven't had a hand up yet, but tonight's the night to ask your question, especially if it has to do with postal policy, because we have an expert on the line. Uh, all right. Uh, a young alum wants to know, as someone who worked both on the Hill and in government relations, do you find that most of your team comes from jobs on the Hill do people often go back to the Hill as well? I've learned about the revolving door between lobbying and legislation in school, but just wondering if you've experienced that yourself. Yes, it's, uh, it, you know, the, the revolving door is alive and well, uh, for, for better or worse. I think that uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a negative connotation around it, but uh, it is how you gain a lot of experience and uh, knowledge working in Congress and can translate that, translate that into helping a company um, craft good public policy. But yes, it, it is definitely alive and well. People often start, I, I actually was a little um, bit different than how most people start their careers, given that I did start in the downtown um, working for a consulting firm that did government relations and then going to the hill and then coming back. There are certainly people who never work in government who have fantastic government relations careers and people who work in government for their entire lives who, who would never consider doing government relations. Um, but there is a lot of back and forth. So do you imagine yourself at some point returning? Um, and if so, in what kind of role? Uh, it would probably have to be for the right job. I really love working for eBay. Um, I love the policy and uh, it's better for my current life situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we'll just have to keep tabs on you and, and make sure you, that, that stays true. Okay, uh, this is a two-part question from uh, Haley Weller, class of 2017. Hi, Haley, great to see your name up here whose father works for the Postal Service, I think. So there's the connection. I just made it. Uh, wow. Anyway, that's not her question, though. Um, Haley says, uh, I'm a senior public policy major at Syracuse University's Maxwell School uh, with a minor in information management and technology. Um, maybe she wants a job. She's telling you uh, what she's doing. But anyway, she said her questions are first. We'll start with the first one. Where did your passion for tech policy stem from and what kind of experience technology wise did you have before switching from public service to the private sector? Sure, uh, I, my passion for tech policy came from great mentors. Um, it was actually not a policy arena that was on my radar when I was in school. Uh, I was really focused on education policy, on uh, women's issues, um, on, you know, for better or worse, what a lot of people consider soft issues. Um, but my first job, I worked for a, a great firm with some great people and had a great mentor who kind of helped me get over my uh, fear of tech policy. Like, oh, I don't really know what I'm talking about here, so I'm just not gonna do any of that. Um, I got really into spectrum policy, working for some of the wireless carriers, which was, I found to be very fascinating. Um, it was when net neutrality first came on the scene as a big policy issue and watching that issue evolve, uh, it's still around today. 
um, was was really yeah, interesting. Don't, and don't hear much um, about net neutrality in COVID nineteen, though. No, well, I mean, you, you do with regards to um, equitable access to, to broadband and services. Uh, I don't think we've seen anything really yet where people are are um, paying for um, you know fast lanes. But um, I, I've been thinking about whether or not it's going to pop up as an issue right now. I, you're right, I haven't seen it yet. But um, yeah, I just having having someone who uh, was able to give me enough of a knowledge base and the courage to uh, understand the policy and, and understand uh, how much it's changing and how many cool and innovative companies and technologies you get to work with when you're working in, in tech policy was, was really helpful for me when I was starting out. Is there a, uh, this isn't Haley's question, her second question, which I'll get to in a second, but is there a, is there a tech policy issue that you think is lurking around the corner or that keeps you up at night that we just haven't fully confronted yet? Uh, something that um, is sort of been backburnered maybe by COVID-19? Well, I think a lot of the consideration that's been going into um, AI and machine learning right now is going to be taking a little bit of a back burner, and unless it's related to con uh, contact tracing. Um, and there are a lot of policy questions around AI uh, that I think we're, we're getting a lot of attention, but are probably going to be in the background for a little while. Yeah. Is, is, was AI getting some attention at eBay as well? I mean, using some AI. Yeah, we're, we're, we've started using, um, I mean, we, we use uh, obviously algorithms and, and machine learning. Um, and we're, we've dabbled in augmented reality and virtual reality. So uh, even though we're kind of seen as like old tech, we, we, we are spending some time in, in some of these newer technologies. Got it. All right, second question from Haley. Um, and as of right now, it's our last question. So I hope someone will add a question or raise their hand. Um, given the rise and importance of cybersecurity, uh, example, election security, do you ever see yourself switching back to public service? Sort of the same a great question. question. Yeah. yeah, no, uh, cybersecurity is a very, very hot policy right now, uh, whether it's from a, um, securing our critical infrastructure perspective or whether it's making sure that companies that have troves of personal data are able to keep it safe and secure. Um, I did a lot of cybersecurity work when I was in Congress. Um, I, I think a fantastic job in like an alternative life would be to be a cyber analyst. Um, mm -hmm. That's not in my career path right now, but uh, I think the people who do that work uh, are I, I just think it's really interesting work and there's a lot of it right now for, for better or worse. Thank you for your questions, Haley. All right, we got another question from, uh, I think he's been on every show, Leon Harbold, one of our alums. Uh, Leon wants to know, in your experience, how influential are the congressional staffers in influencing congressmen and congresswomen in developing their policy positions? Uh, great question. Very, very influential. Um, there are, it, all you have to do is watch a committee hearing or um, members on the floor. You'll often see members who walk in, sit down, pick up a piece of paper, read it word for word, put it down and leave. They probably don't know what they read. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's the staff who, who are doing a lot of that work. Uh, I, that, that's, that's not the norm, but um, yeah, staff do a lot of the work. I mean, there are just so many policy issues out there that um, you really need, no one person can do everything, no matter how smart you are. Um, so staff are researching, they're making recommendations, they're meeting with stakeholders, they're crafting legislation. Staff definitely run the joint. Yeah, well, I, I only know a little bit about that. I, I worked for the federal government for a year as a law clerk to a federal judge in Boston. And, uh, you know, I wrote a lot of memos. I wrote a lot of case law. And for, a, I guess I was 23 or 24, um, you know, you're making federal law. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, certainly my judge edited my, my, my memos quite a bit, but 
uh, he often trusted, you know, once you earned his trust, you, you had a lot of influence. So um, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure a lot of the laws we're looking at today, you had, you had your hand in, right? <laughs> well, me or some other 23 year olds. <laughs> uh, well, we don't have any more questions, but I have a question for you, um, which I yeah. ask most of our, um, our guests. What, what are you now looking back on your Hill career, your Hill school career? Um, what, what do you think were the most influential, um, parts of the Hill school experience that have shaped you into the professional you are today and, and your passions around policy and as a citizen and, and as a, uh, you know, as a person. Well, I, I talked about how, how influential Mr. Ruth was in, in me finding my career, um, Dr. Gerritsen um, was also very influential to me. Um, I have such fond memories. I took his philosophy symposium, which was a I think, two and a half hour class on Sunday nights, mm -hmm. my sixth form year. And, um, you know, having been a day student for three years, getting to uh, sit in my professor's house, drinking tea, talking about ancient Greek philosophy and also anything from, you know, Woody Allen movies to beat poetry uh, was just such the quintessential boarding school experience that I had always kind of been uh, looking for. Um, it's definitely one of my most uh, treasured memories from Hill and, and someone who really taught me how to think critically, which is a skill that everyone needs, um, especially right now with a lot of misinformation out there, thinking about, um, sources and, and, and how to judge information empirically is, is more important now than ever. Um, so that's, that, Doc Garrison and, and that class and that, that experience is definitely one of my most formative experiences at Hill. That's great. Well, Ashley, uh, it's been fascinating. I'm, uh, I'm impressed that your, your girls didn't come crashing in on the, on, on the show here tonight, but, um, Clearly, they're well behaved and and uh, you know staying off the show, which was great. But it would have been fun. Oh, it would have been, hopefully, it, they're in bed. <laughs> it would have been fun. Uh, I'm I'm waiting for that moment to to spruce things up. But uh, seriously, it was a great great to chat with you. And uh, as I mentioned before, a little surreal that the last time I saw you was you know maybe a day or two before everything um, changed for us. So thanks it, for making it, time. It to be honest. Thanks for making time to be on the show. Absolutely. It's, it's really been an honor. Thank you so much for having me. And, and I just want to say again, if, if there are any students who are interested in any of this, please get in touch with me. Uh, there are lots of Hill alum on the Hill. Um, there was at one point, uh, I think someone uh, from Hill was running the policy office of most of the Southeastern Pennsylvania members of Congress. So there's a really great network down here to, to tap into if this is what you're interested in. So, um, you know, I've heard my help in any way that I can, anyone who's interested. Well, uh, we will definitely take you up on that. If anyone wants to talk to Ashley, just send me an email and I will get you in touch with her. Um, as most of you know, we have some great upcoming speakers, uh, some of which I think Ashley's interested in hearing from uh, as well. So coming up, uh, next week, um, April 21st, this is a big one to tune into. Um, I think it's going to be quite interesting. Bernie Chan, class of 1984, who's deputy to the National People's Congress of China in Hong Kong, is going to be talking about how, how Hong Kong has been navigating um, the COVID-19 crisis uh, quite successfully and how they're getting back to work and reopening their economy and their schools uh, and their government. Um, so uh, there are a few months ahead of, of us, so it should be interesting to hear from Bernie. He's always fascinating. On April 23rd, we'll be joined by Stephen Engelbaum, uh, class of 1985, who's an urban planner in San Francisco and talking about the roles that cities and city governments are going to play in the recovery from COVID-19. Uh, we have a few weeks that we're still filling here, um, but then we'll be joined by Pete Sniffen, Colonel Pete Sniffen, class of 81 and a, a parent from the class of 19, who's the uh, army chaplain, career army chaplain, and now works at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And then on May 19th, we'll be joined by Senator Pat Toomey, uh, who is a current and past parent 
um, who is a U.S. Senator for Pennsylvania. So uh, we'll definitely hear a different perspective of policymaking from the Hill, um, and uh, which will be quite interesting. So um, we really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, of course, we're looking forward to some events, uh, some real life campus events coming up on campus here in uh, the fall, uh, the 100th anniversary of the transfer of the school from the Meg family to the Board of Trustees into a nonprofit organization that'll be on September 25th through the 26th, the dedication of the Shirley Quadrivium Center on October 16th. It's a technology place. Ashley, you got to come back. Uh, you're into tech policy. That's where our emerging technologies program will be happening and engineering. Uh, and then Lawrenceville weekend, where we uh, will certainly be challenging the Larrys to keep the Meg's Green Cup on November 6th and 7th. So we'll look forward to having you all join us there to, uh, in the fall. Ashley, thanks again for being on the show. And uh, good luck to you with all of your endeavors. And, and we're going to stay in touch, OK? OK, great. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Tune in next time. Oh, I almost got you to tune in next time. Here we go. Have a good night.